Hi, everyone. Again, this is Samantha Nisi Rashlam L. I wanted to discuss this article and mainly primarily wanting to focus on religion and why black people around the world continue to cling to religion when in reality a lot of them don't even know why they even practice a certain religion they don't even really understand what the religion is about and i think mainly people have to under have to really understand and research and comprehend is where did this religion derive from like why does this religion exist who created it why does it why is it here why are you practicing it even as a child i grew up um as a christian or i guess you want to call us protestant or pentecostal to be more specific um these are things that my aunt told me that those were our more more exact re- religions that we followed as a family but i denounced um christianity and all parts of it uh probably about 3 or 4 years ago completely um and <clears throat> But even as I'll explain to you later why I did, but even as a child, I used to even as a kid or as I got old, I mean I always had a lot of questions, but as I got older, I really started to wonder why was I practicing a specific religion? Why was I practicing Christianity? Was it just because my grandmother practiced it and she really was the one who was very religious and had us going to church like 7 days a week? And uh um, my mom didn't practice religion, but she had grown up under Christianity. So she still allowed us to practice. It. She had a white Jesus hanging up in our homes in our home and you know, it was just it was weird. I don't know. Like my parents just they practiced it but they really didn't go to church, but they didn't stop us from going to church and they actually looked looked upon upon it favorably when I was going to church and picking up I believe my my mom's now husband's mother to take her to church with me. So with that being said, a few years later, I began to really question why was I a Christian and where did it really come from? And so I started to do more research and I didn't like what I saw. I didn't like what I read and I just denounced all of it. like that day I did, there was one day where I just decided I'm not going back. <laughs> and I raised my children now um to be Hebrew where Hebrew Israelites. Um we are the children from the nation of Israel and we really don't practice well we our religion is following God's commandments, God's laws, which many will know it as the 10 commandments, but there's actually a lot more laws than that. So And I also find it really interesting a lot of people do not read the Bible, so they have no clue um what God why we're actually suffering as a black people. So a lot of that a lot of it has to do with the fact that we don't follow God's covenant. We don't keep his covenant. We don't follow his laws. And that's why we suffer. And part of that covenant is to unite as a black race and to not water down or try to become another race because we are the original people, we are God's chosen people and not probably I'm not you know probably not the whole group but I'm not going to uh really focus on that right now but you know either way we were we are the original people, we were made in God's image. and he does not want us he and she do not want us to um they're married <laughs> they do not want us to try to water down our blackness because people treat us like filth um people are treating us this way because we are being punished because we do not keep God's covenant so i'm going to go ahead and read um this article is is named Arab's mortal hatred and enslavement of the black race uh it looks like it was either written or published or both 15 november 
by Na Naiwu Osahan. So it's spelled N A I W U O S A H O N. All right, so let me go ahead and start reading before. Okay, so it says Jerusalem was captured by the Arabs in 638 CE. Alexandria and Egypt fell to them in 643 CE. In 698 CE, they captured Carthage, thus ensuring their political influence in all of northern Africa around the Mediterranean. Arabs, and Arabs did not move into the region until much later, but tried to control it at the time with language and the Islamic religion. The Arabs began to invade Africa in large numbers from 749 CE when they settled in Alexandria, Egypt. They were mistakenly seen as African cousins and were welcomed as saviors from the oppressive rule of the Byzantium, also known as the Greco-Roman um, domination, which I'm sure that's Greek-Roman domination. So they were seeing, African people were seeing the Ar Arabics as cousins and saviors, as African cousins and saviors, and they, they were not. The Arabs did not directly force their religion on the African Egyptians at first, that followed later, but unlike Christianity, Islam could not be translated into local languages. With the Africans looking for something to replace their banned traditional religion, so it's like we always have to have a religion, right? We're always looking for something, like if we can't have this, we gotta find another one. Um, I think we should just change the word and call it our tra traditions instead of focusing on and calling our religion. And let me continue. Um, so with the Africans looking for something to replace their banned traditional religion and impose Greco-Roman Christianity, literacy in Arabic soon spread and assisted by intermarriages and Christian apostasy. The reverse was punishable by, de by death in Islam to gain relief from taxation. Islam quickly became the religion of the land. Although the Quran does not distinguish between races, there is a strong leg legacy of racism against Africans from early Islam because the language, traditions, and customs of the Arabs supports the downgrading of the African race. So let me read that again. <laughs> Although the Quran does not distinguish between races, there is a strong legacy of racism against Africans from early Islam because the language, traditions, and customs of the Arabs supports the downgrading of the African race. So they're downgrading you, which means they're pushing you down further to being second-class citizens, slaves, etc. They're stating that early Islam's language, traditions, and customs of the Arabs supports this. Dr. Azuma, in his book, The Legacy of Arab Islam in Africa, provides several examples of Islam's hatred of blacks. There is the, the example in the Hadith in which an Ethiopian woman laments her racial inferior, inferior, inferiority to Muhammad, who consoles her by saying, In paradise, the whiteness of the Ethiopian will be seen over the stretch of a thousand years. Another Hadith quotes Muhammad thus, Do not bring black into your pedigree. In fact, the Arabic word for slave, Abid, became equated with Africans and blacks with the advent of Islam. Osama bin Laden, in a discussion with the Sunni's American novelist Kola Booth in Morocco in 1996, said, When next you meet an Arab, you should ask what is the Arabic word for slave. You'll discover that the words are the same, Abid, which is why when an Arab looks at a black African, what he sees is a slave. Muhammad owned and sold black slaves. In fact, he ordered and built the pulpit of his mosque with African slave labor. The Quran encourages sex with female slaves in several places. Classical Islamic law allows a light-skinned Muslim man to marry a black woman, but a black Muslim man is restricted from marrying a light-skinned woman. As the literature of the time put it, only a whore prefers blacks. The good woman will welcome death rather than being touched by a black man. So interwoven is slavery with Islam that Islam's holiest city, Mecca, site of the Hajj pilgrimage, was a slave trading capital. Quoting Azuma again, up until the 20th century, Mecca served as the gateway to the Muslim world for slaves brought out of Africa. Let me read that again. Quoting Azuma again, up until the 20th century, Mecca served as the gateway 
to the Muslim world for slaves brought out of Africa. It became a custom for pilgrims to take slaves for sale in Mecca or buy one or two slaves while on Hajj as souvenirs to be kept, sold, or given as gifts. Muslim Arab and Persian literature depicts blacks as stupid, untruthful, vicious, sexually unbridled, ugly and distorted, excessively merry, and easily affected by music and drink. Nasir al-Din Tusi, a famous Muslim scholar, said of blacks, the ape is more capable of being trained than the Negro. Abin Khaldun, an early Muslim thinker, writes that blacks are only humans who are closer to dumb animals than to rational beings. Abin Sina, Av- Avi Sina, 19, 980 to 1037. Arab's most famous and influential philosopher, scientist, and Islam describe blacks as people who are by their very nature slaves. He wrote, all African women are prostitutes and the whole race of African men are abid, slave stock. He equated black people with rats plaguing the earth. Ibn Khaldun, an Arab historian stated that blacks are characterized by levity and excitability and great emotionalism, adding that they are everywhere described as stupid. Al Dimashki, an Arab pseudoscientist wrote, the equator is inhabited by communities of blacks who may be numbered among the savage beasts. Their complexion and hair are burnt and they are physically and morally abnormal. Their brains almost boil from the sun's heat. Ibn al Faki al Hamadani painted this no less horror picture of black people. The Sanj, or the blacks, are overdone until they are burned, so that the child comes out between black, murky, maladorous, stinking, and crinkly haired, with uneven limbs, deficient minds, and depraved passions. Arab's attitudes to blacks derives from Genesis' racist fiction of the three sons of Noah. Ham, Japheth, and Shem. Arabs claim that the accursed Ham was the progenitor of the black race, that Japheth begot the full-faced, small-eyes Europeans, and that Shem fathered the handsome of face with beautiful hair Arabs, of course. After the, the Arabs had conquered Egypt and shortly after Muhammad's death, they began demanding Nubian slaves from the south. This continued for 600 years. Dominated African kingdoms were forced to send on a regular basis tributes of slaves to the Arab ruler in Cairo. From as early as the 6th century CE, they had developed slavery supply networks out of Africa, from the Sahara to the Red Sea, and from Ethiopia, Somalia, and East Africa to feed demands for slaves all over the Islamic world and the Indian Ocean region. The African male slaves were castrated and used as domestic servants or to work the Sahara salt deposits or on farms all over the Islamic world. The African female servants were continuously raped before being sold to households to be used as sex labor. Of springs from the illicit, offsprings from the illicit encounters were largely destroyed as unworthy to live. Between 650 CE and 1905 CE, over 20 million African slaves have been delivered through the Tans, I'm not sure if they mean Trans-Sahara route alone to the Islamic world or Tans-Sahara route alone, alone to the Islamic world. So that's 20 million African slaves have been delivered alone just to the Islamic world. This does not even include the transatlantic slave trade that included the West. Dr. John Alambella Bila Azuma, in his book, The Legacy of Arab Islam in Africa, estimates that over 80 million more died en route. A text from Dr. Azuma books provides this quote from a Zanzibar observer about the travails of African slaves en route to slave markets around the Arabic world. As they filed past, we noticed many chained together by the neck. The women who were as numerous as the men carried babies on their backs in addition to a tusk of ivory or other burden on their heads. It is difficult to adequately describe the fifty state, the filthy state of their bodies. In many instances, not only scarred by the whip, but feet and shoulders were a mass of open sores. Half-starved, ill-treated creatures who, weary and friendless, must have longed for death.
A Muslim herdsman in Dr. Azuma's book described the fate of those who became too ill or too weak to continue the journey as follows. We spirit them at once, for if we did not, others would pretend they are ill in order to avoid carrying their loads. No, we never leave them alive on the road. They all know this custom. When Ashley carries the ivory, when a mother gets too tired to carry both her baby and the ivory, the herdsman replies, she does. We cannot leave valuable ivory on the road. We spear the child and make her burden lighter. lighter. Beneath, b- between 9th and 10th centuries, several millions of Zanj, black slave, or also known as black, slaves were imported from Zanzibar to lower Iraq, where they constituted more than half the total population and worked to clear saline lands for irrigation and to cultivate sugar. The African slaves were transported through Mombasa, Zanzibar, and the Sudan. More millions of African slaves were involved in the Islamic experience on the East African route than in the West African Sahara route. At first, they were used largely for military purposes, then as domestic servants, concubines, or eunuchs in affluent Muslim households. So let me read that one more time. More millions. More millions, okay? So they said there was between the 9th and 10th centuries, several millions of, of Zanj slaves were imported from Zanzibar to lower Iraq, where they constituted more than half the total population and were to clear, sla- and clear saline lands for irrigation and to cultivate sugar. The African slaves were transported through Mombasa, Zanzibar, and the Sudan. More millions of African slaves were involved in the Islamic experience on the East African route than in the West African Sahara route. Okay? So we have the transatlantic slave trade that everyone knows about and everyone assumes that all black people that are involved in that slave trade were from West Africa. But right here, it is revealing that there are more millions of African slaves that were involved in Islamic ex- slave trade, or they call it experience, on the East African route than in the West African Sahara route put together. Okay, so let me continue. At first, they were used largely for military purposes than as domestic servants, concubines, or eunuchs in affluent Muslim households. So this is interesting to me as well because I see, when I see certain Arabic people, they tend to have a lot of wealth. And... This explains now why they are so wealthy here in America because of a lot of so much slavery that went on in the uh, Islamic nations. Okay, uh, so let me continue where I left off. In Northern Africa, many became galley slaves and in the Persian Gulf, pearl divers, port laborers, sailors, or date farmhands. Some notable Africans from the Arab slavery experience included the Nubian eunuch Abu E. Miss Kufer, Kufer uh, who became regent of Egypt in the 10th century, and Sidi Badr, Bader, who briefly seized the throne of ben- Bengal in the 1490s. There was also the 17th century great African Muslim general Miles, Miles Ambar, who, or Maiz Ambar, who led the resistance of the Deccan, Deccans against the Mughals. Mughals. A distinctive African community was served culturally in a place called Jif- Jiruft in Iran. So let me spell some of these names. Uh, so we have Miss Kufer. Uh, he is a notable African from the Arab slavery experience. That was included in the Nubian eunuch. Then we have Sidi Bader. S-I-D-I-B-A-D-A-R. Then we had my males, Miles, Males, Ambar, M A I L S, uh, space A M B A R. Uh, he led the resistance of the Deccans against the Mughals, which is spelled M U G H A L S. And he said this was a distinctive, a distinctive African community, has survived culturally in a place called Jeruft, and that's spelled J I R U F T in Iran. With the death of Askia Muhammad, the emperor of Sungai in 1528 CE, Sungai Empire started falling apart. This was the opportunity Ahmad al-Mansur, the emperor of Morocco, had been waiting for to conquer Western Sudan after his Spanish humiliation. 
He took his time to plan his invasion, and when he fell ready in 1591 CE, he sent an army of some 4,000 musketeers under the leadership of a Spanish mercenary officer, uh, okay, called Judar Pasha. The army crossed the Sahara and was on the border of Sangai before serious attention was given to it. Sangai's ruler, Askia Ishak II, called up a superior number of army but relying on traditional weapons. The two armies met on April 12, 1591. So they were stating that the Sangai ruler, Askia Ishak II, he called up his superior number of army but they only had uh, traditional weapons to rely on uh, versus uh, versus the uh, army of Askia Mah- uh, no, I'm sorry, not Muskia, Muskia Mah- Ahmad al Mansur, the emperor of Morocco, who had been waiting to conquer Western Sudan. So the two armies met on April 12, 1591 at a small town called Tandibi, about 50 miles from the capital of capital city of Gao, or G-A-O. In spite of the, bra- uh, the brave stand of the Sungai army, the Moroccan soldiers overwhelmed them and moved into the country to wreak havoc. So when they were talking about the Morocco army in uh, the beginning, they said that he had his Spanish humiliation, uh, Ahmad al Mansour, and then the guy that ran his military, his uh, army, the 4,000 musketeers were under the Sp- Spanish mercenary officer called Judar Pasha. So that's that's interesting. It seems like Spain is being tied into Morocco, which went on to conquer uh, the Sungai Empire. Yeah, in Western Sudan. Okay. So they said, in spite of the brave stand of the Sungai army, the Moroccan soldiers are overwhelmed them and moved into the country to wreak havoc. And it's interesting because Sungai sounds like a Chinese name, so does Gao, G-A-O. So the Moroccan soldiers overwhelmed them and moved into the country to wreak havoc. Professor Clark, and I'm thinking they're, they're meaning John Hamrick Clark, this only Professor Clark I know, but... Um, he informs us that the Moroccan invasion of Sungai and eventually other nations of the Western Sudan was made all the more tragic because in most cases it was Muslim against Muslim. The invaders uh, from North Africa and their European mercenary troops did not spare anyone, not man, woman, or child. They pitilessly, pitilessly slew the now demoralized citizens who cried out to them, We are Muslims. We are your brothers in religion. The war brought no honor to either side, and in the years that followed, an appreciation of African intellectual and material contribution to Spain and the other nations of the Mediterranean sphere was lost from the respectful commentary of human history. Of course, that's the first thing they do is get rid of uh, all that we contributed so they can pretend like we are these savages that they state that we are. Um... The mid-18th century saw the growth of Islamic Tariqa, and I, I'm, I'm a black woman, by the way, in case you guys are wondering, like, who is us? Yes, I'm the blacks, or, you know, part of the, the black, I'm the black race, or part of the black race. So, yeah, the mid-18th century saw the growth of Islamic Tariqa, an aggressive form of religious worship, intolerant of traditional or other religious religions, culture, or customs. So, Tariqa had two divisions. Tanzania and Kadiria, Kadiria, and were usually led locally by charismatic, learned, and well-traveled clerics determined to purify and cleanse fellow Muslims and conquer non-believers through the jihad, also known as the Holy War. So the Holy War is basically people forcing people to become uh, certain religions. So talk about irony. So you're using war to force people into something that you claim is godly? No thanks. <clears throat> so Usman Dan Fodio of Sakato, northern Nigeria, and Umar Ibn Saeed Tal of Tukolor, Tukolor, Western Sudan, were two of such leaders 
who started out as reformers and ended as rulers of large tracts of land and people. Many African Muslim leaders have used the rhetoric of jihad to capture power for themselves. Okay, so it says many of the many of the African Muslim leaders used the rhetoric of jihad to capture power for themselves. When the Yoruba leaders in Western Nigeria were fighting each other for supremacy in the 1820s because of the breakdown of Oyo Kingdom, jihad leaders invited from northern Nigeria to intervene, grab the leadership of northern Yoruba land instead. Their advance southwards to dip the Quran into the sea, as they called it, was only stopped after a hard fight at the edge of the forest into southern Yoruba land. So, was stating here that the, when the Yoruba leaders in Western Nigeria were fighting each other for supremacy in the 1820s because of the breakdown of the Oyo Kingdom, Jihad leaders invited from, invited, they were invited from northern Nigeria to intervene. Okay. <laughs> instead, they grabbed the leadership of northern Yor- Yoruba land instead. So what we had was two African nations. So you had northern Nigeria, and then you had Western Sudan, were two of such leaders who started out as reformers and ended as rulers of large tracts of land and people. Many African Muslim leaders have used the rhetoric of jihad to capture power for themselves. So they, uh, to, from what I'm reading, were African Muslim leaders and they were fighting each other. And then when the Yoruba leaders in Western Nigeria were fighting each other uh, from supremacy in the 1820s, they invited the jihad leaders into the kingdom. The Northern Nigeria leaders invited... Uh, The invited the jihad leaders to intervene, and instead the the land of the Yoruba leaders was taken by these jihad leaders instead. And they said it was only stopped after a hard fight at the edge of the forest into southern Yoruba land. So I guess they they didn't completely conquer, but they were attempting to take the land from the Yoruba leaders, the jihad leaders. So that that teaches you to stop relying on your way to win, to be with people who don't look like you, who aren't really uh, practicing the same, I guess, religion as you, so to speak. But I guess they thought they were all Muslim, so that was okay. And that just lets me know that religion is full of shit, basically. I mean, it's like we're we're both Muslim brothers, and we're both brothers in, in Christian in Christianity, or whatever and then you still get killed by your quote-unquote brother so or backstabbed or whatever it's just bullshit to say the least like there's really no other word for me to come up with to explain what i think of religion all three um islam islamic religion christianity and judaism are all crap they've all they're all used to control people and destroy and to corrupt and gain resources for selfish purposes there's i've i've yet to see any of those religions um overall being positive i mean look at the roman catholic church it was one of many religions that was over the slave that really constructed and uh supported the slave trade the the uh, the transatlantic slave trade i mean it really a lot of these wars and just very inhumane instances that have occurred would not have even been able to be possible without the religions that backed them. So, I say fuck religion. Like, I refuse to um, agree with religion because religion is usually used to control and oppress and it doesn't typically benefit the 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 little person the little man the person at the bottom of the of the pile is usually just created to make the top guy or woman which usually is a guy uh wealthy and i don't know just from my experience like i just don't i don't see it or my and my research i just don't see it being something that black black people should ever take part in it's never benefited us so 
All right, so next, uh, continuing to read before my battery dies. Samora Ture used jihad to take over control of a large portion of the upper Nigeria region in the 1870s and 1880s. In 1881, Muhammad Ahmad, having conquered eastern Sudan, declared himself the Mahdi, only to be succeeded after his death by another Muslim leader, Khalifa Abdallah, Ab, Abdallahi Ra, Rabi, or R-A-B-I-H. After taking over leadership of Central Sudan, i.e. southwest of Darfur, in 1893. And it's interesting because as, as a child or even growing up, like I just, I've heard of these places, but I never really understood what their wars were about and what were they fighting over. Now it's starting to make sense. Um, so the advanced west was to take control of Bornu and Nigeria from another Muslim leader who had himself dethroned the ancient Sai Saifawa dynasty founded it in the 8th century CE. By the end of the 19th century CE, nearly all of Sudan from the Nile to the Atlantic was under Muslim leaders. So, they're talking about how Samori Toure used jihad to take over control of a large portion of the upper Niger region in the 1870s and the 1880s. That's not that long ago. And in 1881, Muhammad Ahmad, having to conquer eastern Sudan, declared himself the Mahdi the Mahdi only to be succeeded after his death by another Muslim leader. So the Mahdi is a, it's like a person sent from God to save their people. And he, so he declared himself that. <laughs> um, and I'll talk about that more later from my research of, of that. Um, so, so Khalifa Abdel Rabi Rabi or Rabi, I don't know. After taking a relationship with Central Sudan, okay. Um, so they advanced westwards to take control of Bornu in Nigeria from another Muslim leader who had himself dethroned the ancient Sai Saifawa. Dynasty founded in the 8th century CE. By the end of the 19th century CE, nearly all of Sudan from the Nile to the Atlantic was under Muslim leaders. The chaos and devastation that followed the invasions finally set out Africa for the intense Islamic and European slave trade that followed. As the Muslim conquest and religion spread throughout North Africa and across the Sahara into West Africa, so did Arab hunger to enslave the Africans increase. This trade in African slaves, begun by the Arabs, went on inter uninterrupted from the 6th century CE to the 19th century CE, softening Africa militarily, culturally, economically, socially, and politically for the joint European and Arab onslaught on African people and economy from the 15th century CE. Um, so this paragraph is huge. It, it basically states that the tra this trade that they really, they got more hungry for more slavery, uh, African slavery, to be increased uh, after their invasions that they had done around the ninth, by the end of the 19th century, uh, they were feeling, I guess, powerful and, you know, like they've accomplished much and now they wanted even more African slaves. And it basically stated that uh, the, the trade of the African slaves begun by the Arabs went on from the 6th century to the 19th century. So all we do is focus on white supremacy and so on and so forth, but we don't even think about the Arabs and all the crap that they've done to our people that basically opened the door for European and Arabs to jointly continue this onslaught because the Arabs... Uh, came and attacking, you know, and beating down African peoples until they were softened uh, militarily, culturally, economically, socially, and politically. So we weren't even strong enough to fight back at all at that point. So when European joined in around the 15th century, uh, it just, it was just that much easier for them to do what they came in to do because we were already weakened. So, Arabs were the principal raiders and middlemen for the Atlantic slave trade that decimated populations in West African, West Africa. And let me read that again. Arabs were the principal raiders and middlemen for the Atlantic slave trade that decimated populations in West Africa. In the late 18th century CE, with most of the slave trade along the West African coast dominated by Christians, 
okay so they're saying most of the slave trade along the western coast was dominated by christians okay the bulk of the arab slave trade shifted to zanzibar conquered then by omani arabs omani sultan saeed 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 an arab as a new ruler of zanzibar expanded the business in slavery and the trade in ivory considerably in 1840 by reopening and developing old established routes into the interior to the Great Lakes and the Congo. While retaining some slaves to staff their expanding clove plantations in Zanzibar and neighboring Pemba, they, as usual, exported the great majority of their African slaves. Okay, so they exported, and they said this is as usual, they exported the majority of the, the African slaves. So they kept some to work the plantations, their clove plantations, and, exp and, and the expansion of the clove plantation in Zanzibar and neighboring Pemba, but as usual, majority of those African slaves were exported. They were sent out. And that would have been part of the Western um, slave trade that we knew of. The American, like when we came to America, and Jamaica, and um, Central America, so on and so forth. Uh, <clears throat> so the Omani Arabs, as the Sultan's invaders, were known, raided were known raided villages killing and maiming thousands of people in the interior of the african continent to capture and sell some twenty thousand of them yearly yearly they sold twenty thousand at their notorious zanzibar slave market from there slaves were sold and cargoed all over the mediterranean europe the persian gulf and asia those designed destined for send in Pakistan, for instance, first arrived in the Amani port of Muscat, from where they were shipped to Karachi. Some reached Sindh through owner-to-owner -owner transactions originating from points along the Makran coast of the present-day Pakistani and Irani Balashistans. The African slaves involved were mainly Swahili from areas now known as Kenya and mainland Tanzania. The Muslim African captives fared no better than their West African kith and kin enslaved by the West in the New World. Arabs did not only start to sell African slaves in the 6th and 19th century in the Islamic world, they were the principal raiders, merchants, and middlemen for the Atlantic slave trade. Okay? They were the principal ones from the 6th to the 19th century. That's a lot of fucking centuries, okay? I don't know if you guys can do the math, but that's way more centuries than was what we know of slavery that ha occurred in America. So we've been going through slavery for a lot longer than that, and it started with the Arabs. Um, in fact, even now, hundreds of years later, now let's focus on this, like, because um, I just watched a documentary, I believe it was on Netflix, that was talking about the, the Dalits. Uh, I believe that's what they're called. And they're also known as the Untouchables. Um, you should check out that documentary one day. And I did, I did not know this, that they were uh, derived of, of this, an African settler slave group. So it states, in fact, even now, hundreds of years later, millions of African settler slaves are still being discriminated against and treated as the scum of the earth, also known as the untouchables in Pakistan, India, Iran, Iraq, and all the Muslim states of Asia, the Persian Gulf, in northern Africa. Expansion of Western influence all over Africa, especially after the European tar partition in 1884 CE, tended to restrict Islam to purely missionary activities. During the period of sharing influence with the West over the direction of African destiny, Islam did not suffer the disadvantage of Christianity's link with the conqueror regimes, and so was able to consolidate and expand so islam didn't suffer the disadvantage of christianity they were able to continue on to conquer and, and do great things for themselves by the 19th century for example 65 to 90 percent of the swahili muslim population of zanzibar was enslaved it, that's ridiculous that's crazy that's crazy so a lot of us think that slavery ended when was seven no like the 18th the 18th uh century or the ninth well yeah 19th century 
for the most part. We thought it was done like the 1800s. But here it's stating that it continued on. The 19th century, there was still 65 90% of the Swahili and Muslim population of Zanzibar was enslaved, plus 90% on the Kenyan coast and in Madagascar was enslaved. And in Ghana, 30% of the Af- African Muslims were enslaved. Since the dawn of flag independence in Africa from the 1960s, it has been business as usual with regular threats of jihad. Several African youths are being recruited into guerrilla activities after training in Libya or received with promises of better wages and smuggled out of Africa to the Arab world, particularly to Lebanon and Afghanistan, to work as domestic servants behind iron walls of seclusion, deprivation, abject misery, and poverty. So we still have a lot of African youths joining militaries uh, after they train in Libya and they're being deceived of, you know, promises of better wages and instead they're being smuggled out of Africa to the Arab world, particularly Lebanon and Afghanistan, to be slaves, basically. Uh, Arab enslavement, and this is happening in 1960s and onward. Arab enslavement of black Africans continues to this day in the Muslim world, particularly in the Sudan, Niger, and Mauritania. All right, in my Rati Tania. Uh, to admit that it is a mistake would be to admit the fall- fallibility of the Quran and bring is fallibility of the Quran, fall- fallibility of the Quran, which means that you would have to admit um, the mistakes of the Quran and the the. Uh, that the Quran has its uh, faults and that it's not probably really a truthful book to follow like the Bible um, and bring its divine origin into question even a day uh, so okay so they're saying to admit that the Arab enslavement of black Africans that's continuing today in Sudan, Nigeria and Marat- Mauritania Mauritania would admit be admitting the the fallibility of the Quran and bring its divine origin into question. Even today, Muslims act as if Islamic slavery was a favor done to the millions of unfortunate men, women, and children who were forcibly uprooted from their native lands and sent to lives of sexual and mental servitude deep in the Islamic world. So they're making excuses now for why the slavery is occurring, so that the Quran can still have an upstanding. Um, position in the world but no so Arab imperialism is worse than European imperialism only that the latter is less subtle and more widespread so European imperialism is less subtle people know that white people are racist they don't lie they keep it they just let it be out there and it's more widespread it's not as uh um Condensed is not like in one area. It's kind of like all over the world. Either way, the bottom line is that black people are, are just slaves for every race. That's that's the reality of that. Um, Europeans really, relatively have some conscience, not much, but they are at least slightly more tolerant of dissent than the Arabs. Europeans did not completely destroy African cultures. Um, they tried to. Our history and religions, yes. While our cultures and traditions were largely derided as primitive and banned, ignored, or marginalized. They tried to destroy, so let's not give them any credit. In all areas conquered by Islam, the natives lost their ethnic names, religions, and peculiar way of life to those of their Arab masters. The slaves of the religiously colonized Muslims are left bare without a past or future of their own, a worse form of slavery and emasculation. The Arabs stripped us totally of everything, our history, religions, cultures, names, languages, and traditions, 
Their religion overwhelmed our cultures and traditions wherever they conquered us. To the extent that Africans and Arab governed states today no longer bear their original African names, nor do they remember their history. They cannot even recall that they were black, independent, and thriving communities before the Arabs colonized them. They cannot imagine that they were the original settlers and masters of the entire Arab world. All African natives in Arab governed countries think that Allah ordained their inferior status to the Arabs. What? <laughs> I mean, can we fucking read? Like, read a book to know the truth. Like, don't just stop just li- allowing people to tell you what you are and who you are. Egypt is still so intimidated by its glorious black African past that its Arab government would not allow thorough research into Egypt's past. President Gamal Abdel Nasser falsified Egyptian history when he declared Egypt an Arab Republic. Anwar Sadat was forced to divorce his black wife, denounce his black children, and marry a light-skinned cousin before becoming Egypt's president. Egyptian authorities refused to allow American filmmakers to make a film on the life of Anwar Sadat, his last name, his name is spelled A-N-W-A-R, last name S-A-D-A-T, in Egypt on the ground that the actor chosen for the Sadat's role was black. So they did not want that movie made because the actor was going to be black because Egyptians are originally black, black people. Um, when Morocco left the OAU in 1984, it aspired to become a member of the European Union. In Egypt, Tunisia, Morocco, Algeria, Libya, Sudan, Somalia, er- Eritrea, Eritrea, Eritrea Mauritania, and the rest of the Arab world, Africans are treated as the scum of the earth. They are second-class citizens at the very best in their own countries. Blacks in these countries cannot aspire to positions of respect or authority. There are hardly Africans in, a- in high government positions in Arab government African countries. Like Brazil, which is just as racially cruel against their black natives, there is no legislation favoring slavery, except in Mauritania. It is simply a way of life, that's all. Blacks do not really exist, or at best, are not humans. Mauritania left the economic community of West African states to join the union formed by the Arab North African states. A few years ago, Mauritania sacked all black natives from their civil service positions. Black Martinians protest their plight to the African Union, AU, without receiving attention because AU black leaders fear offending their Arab colleagues in the AU. How pathetic is that? Okay? That's why Africans stay at the bottom because we keep fucking forming alliances with people who don't look like us, who are not us, who don't identify as us. They may look like us, but if you don't identify as being a black person, you're not black, you're not having your allegiance to black, the the betterment of black people, then you're not, they're not a friend. And that's why we say the bottom, because we keep friending, befriending people who are our mortal, mortal enemies. And they do us in every time. In Martinia, they have had to declare an end to slavery six times in a century alone. And still nothing has changed for the captive majority African natives. African slavery is still in their statute books. African slavery in Martinia is what the ongoing quarrel between Martinia and Senegal is about. The quarrel forced black African refugees to pour across the border from Martinia into Senegal. In Algeria, Arabs throw stones at black people, including diplomats, in markets and other public places. To quote Professor Clark, Arabs always act as though they are not in Africa. Once when I was visiting Egypt, I told my Egyptian Arab host to get a cab ready for the next morning that I was going to Kenya. So you're going to Africa to visit your people. We got no diseases here. Why are you leaving us? The host asked. As if they're not. This guy asks as if Egypt is not in Africa. What an idiot. Across the Red Sea in Mecca, Saudi Arabia, blacks are treated worse than animals after using their life savings to go there on pilgrimage. Why isn't anyone telling this story? I mean, come on, black people. We got technology now. Let's keep it 100 and tell these stories. I actually did not hear that from Malcolm X. So that's, that's quite interesting. Hundreds of blacks who have lived all their lives in Saudi Arabia are being re- repatriated, repatriated daily after losing an arm or a leg for some minor or trumped-up offense and with, without regard for their comfort, welfare, or rights. Um, racism towards black Muslims in Saudi Arabia is so strong, it makes one wonder if making pilgrimage to Mecca should be one of the five pillars of the Muslim faith and why blacks bother to be Muslim. Colonel Gaddafi saw vicious white racism in the tragic death in August 1997 
of Princess Diana of Wales, the mother of a future king of England and her Arab lover. But no one remembered to ask Gaddafi was whether he himself was disposed to allowing any daughter of his to marry even the richest black man in the world, let alone a black Libyan. If one were to ask Gaddafi why Africans are not high up in his government, he might balk that all Libyans are Africans. In that case, one should go and find out the truth for oneself in the poor sections of town. One would be shocked by the plight of our African kith and kin that constitute the bulk of the population in oil-rich Libya and other, other northern African countries similarly afflicted with Arab racism. While pretending to champion pan-African interests, he is busy deporting black immigrants. So while Gaddafi is pretending to champion pan-African interests, he is busy deporting black, black immigrants. Okay, I had to read that again for you guys. Uh, because a lot of people aren't reading or doing their own research about these people that they're saying were are for black people. You had to really, if they don't look like you, uh, identify as black, as a black person, not African, as a black person. You had to really try to figure out why is this, why is this person pretending to be on my side? Like, what's really the the agenda here? Because it's always race is always going to be about race. At the end of the day, it's, it's a competition, and race is the reward. They whatever race you are, you want your race to survive and win. And that's how it's always going to be. Once black people realize that we can actually get joined into the race as well. Right now, we're not even in the com- in the competition. Um, on May on nine May 1997, in flagrant defiance of a UN embargo on flights in and out of Libya, Colonel Gaddafi invaded Nigeria with his planes carrying 1,000 members of his ragtag army, plus 500 journalists. They strategically occupied the Kano Airport and his other reception facilities, facilities with the connivance of the Nigerian Muslim dictator host. The purpose was to launch a jihad in supposedly religiously secular Nigeria or at least precipitate a serious schism schism between the predominantly Muslim north of the country and the Christian and animist south. Right now, the Muslim world is trying to use Sharia to dismember Nigeria. Pakistan, Libya, and Saudi Arabia, to name a few, have pumped substantial funds into Zamfara, the first of Nigeria's Sharia states, to start the process of Islamizing, or at least trigger mayhem and civil war in Nigeria, as in Sudan. No nation in Africa has suffered more in the hands of the Arabs than Ethiopia. It has been going on since Arabs first invaded Africa in the 7th century CE. Recently, with Libya supporting the people of Eritrea, they destroyed the basic structure of of Ethiopia to cut her from the sea and weaken the section of Africa, this section of Africa and eventually all of Africa, for further... Arabization. They did this mercilessly with religion. Did you hear that? They did this mercilessly with religion. So whenever black people decide to cut the umbilical cord of religion and learn how to stand on their own two feet and with their own, their other black brothers and sisters stop relying on, you know, whitey or white Jesus or some religion to save you. The only thing that's going to save you is uniting with people that are also black who believe in what you believe in which is black true black liberation um you cannot be selfish with this you have to be selfless you have to be for other black people and honestly i believe if all of us just came back to africa and took over africa like we could kick those kick those people out you know we got but we can't be constantly getting in bed with people that don't look like us or who aren't considering themselves to be black you know if they think they're Arabic or whatever or white or whatever it's like why are you creating offspring with these people the offspring are going to grow grow up and turn against you they're going to use them to grow up and turn against you just like they do with, with religion so in the last 38 years Gaddafi at one time or the other tried to force Libya's unification with Egypt, Algeria, etc. And has continued the effort since with, since with Sudan. He forcibly annexed the Azan Strip from Chad and sponsored destabilization in Liber, Liber, Liberia, Sierra Leone, Uganda, Mali, Cote d'Ivoire, Niger, etc. in pursuance of his Ar- Arabization of Africa policy, laced with inordinate imperial personal ambition. In 1998, his strategy got a fillip with the founding of his community of Sahel Savannah Savannah States, 
Say Hell Savannah States or C N E N dash S A D, which he was hoping to use to control the embassaged in- 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 African Union or AU. The C E N dash SAD or SINSAD at the moment ropes in 25 African states from West, East, and Central Africa and includes Senegal, Cote d'Ivoire, Chad, Sudan, Somalia, Comoro Islands, etc. Most of these unsuspecting African countries were stable until they joined SINSAD. Okay, so they said most of these unsuspecting African countries were stable until they joined SINSAD. So these 25 countries were roped in thinking. This is going to be uh, for the betterment of them uh, under Colonel Muammar Gaddafi, who considers himself to be Arabic. So why did they think that was going to be a better choice for them? When will we wake the fuck up? When will we (laughs) look at history and realize what has not worked for us? Stop the madness. Blending with other races does not work for black people. It has never ever in history ever benefited black people period colonel muammar gaddafi pushed desperately for a united states of africa government to be approved set up and launched right there and then at the ninth ordinary session of the assembly of the heads of states of the african union held in july 2007 in accra ghana so this is just in july 2007 this was 10 years ago in accra ghana he has heightened his arabization policy pursuit at the au level since 2001 Pretending, pretending to be promoting the Pan-African agenda of Kwame Nkrumah, um, Chen Wazu, the renowned scholar, described Gaddafi's Arab Black African Africa government plan at the time as unification. Okay, so his name is is spelled C H I N W E I Z U. He is a quote unquote renowned scholar described Gaddafi's Arab Black Africa government plan at the time as unification of the N-word monkey with Python. So they actually wrote out the N-word. So he's saying it's a unification between the nigger monkey with Python. I'm going to go ahead and say the word. Um, But I really hate that word. But anyways, that's what he saw it as. Uh, Arabs themselves divide Africa into North Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa. Saharan Africa to instigate a division and as long as the invaders continue to occupy our land and treat us as slaves in North Africa, the two segments of the continent cannot cohabit. Okay, so we have... They continue in Northern Africa to, to treat the other sub-Saharan Africans as slaves and occupying the land they're invaders. Um, and they're saying they can't, they can't become as one in that, with that... Uh, situation current situation in a paper presented at the meeting of the arab league in amman jordan in 2001 muammar gaddafi spelled out the arabization agenda against africa in language reminiscent of adolf hitler's leban saram hitler's sick obsession to secure a living space for political and economic expansion in europe for the germans the superior race quote-unquote the superior race Gaddafi, in his address during the Amman's Arab conference, invited his Arab brothers outside of Africa to come to Africa in the following words. The third of the Arab community living outside Africa should move in with the two-thirds, about 250 million on the continent, and join the African Union, which is the only space we have. Gaddafi's unbridled urge in modern times to enlarge Arabia inside Africa is a continuation of the Arab war against Africans and the Arabization of African lands that started in the 7th century CE. See, they've never forgotten. We try to keep forgetting. These people have never forgotten what this war is about. It's about conquering land and getting rid of black people or the other races. And let me continue. Arabs have since settled on one third of Africa, pushing continuously southwards towards the Atlantic Ocean. Arabs racial war, okay, a racial war against black Africa started with their occupation and colonization of Egypt between 637 and 642 CE, decimating the Coptic or black population. Between 642 and 670 CE, more Arab invaders poured into Africa and occupied areas known today 
as Tunisia, Libya, Algeria, and Morocco, where they physically eliminated most of the native Berber, Berber inhabitants. The Berbers that escaped death ran westward and southwards towards the Sahara. Then in the 11th century CE, fresh Arab migrants of nomadic origin migrated into North Africa to displace and drive the remaining pastoral Berbers deeper into the Sahara Desert. With Arab consolidation and backing in Northern Africa, okay, new waves of Arab invaders and migrants pushed deeper into the Nile banks, inhabited then by the Nilotic Shiluk. They continued all the way down to where Dwaim stands today. That's spelled D-U-E-I-M, stands today. Belonging then to the Dinka and Fernani Atakthons. At At the entire territory was known at the time as Balad as Sedan, the Arabic for land of the blacks. So this was supposed to be the, uh, the land for the blacks at the time. And currently includes the Republic of Sudan. Um, continue with their Arabization of Africa land policy through elimination. Okay, that's the first one that was on it. Elimination. They're just trying to eliminate you altogether. Displacement. Separation. Marginalization. And suppression. Their Arab invaders of Balad as, as Sudan over the passage of time decimated the population of the Nilotic Shaluk, Dinka, and Fernani Atakthans, owners of the land and pushed to restrict the, the rest waiting for elimination to the Darfur area and the south of the country, which the Arab invaders are now intent on taking from the native black Africans. This is the genesis of the war in Sudan. It is a racial war. It is a racial war. The Arabs want the Republic of Sudan, which by landmass is the largest country in Africa, to be an entirely Arab state by exterminating the black native population gradually to the last person. The war in Sudan is our modern day Haiti war in terms of black liberation and our recent fight against apartheid. Arabs are carrying out ethnic cleansing right now in Southern Sudan with the financial support of the Arab world, particularly in Libya and Saudi Arabia. China is backing them against Africa, okay? The Janjaweed, with Sunnis and Arab governments backing, are trying to wipe out the black population so as to expropriate their lands, but Africans, including Nigerians, do not know where their interests should reside. So Nigerians are actually confused, and other Africans are actually confused like where their interests should reside. It should reside with other Africans who are black like you. That's... That's that simple. Like how all the Arabs are coming together to push you out. That's uh, to get first. You need to focus on being black first. And then once you push everybody out, then you can be on Nigeria and, and whatever. No one has time for that anyway, though. We were always just Africans. I mean, these new countries, where did they really who was creating these? So let's we'll discuss that on another day. So the Arabs succeeded in doing the same thing in North Africa where the original Nubian African owners of the land have almost all been wiped out and the rest marginalized or also known as enslaved by the, the, their Arab invaders, settlers since 642 CE, okay? So I wanted to originally research it because I wanted to know what happened. Like where did this grand Egypt go? Like how did Egypt fall? And it's because we let the Arabs in. And they started procreating with us and having kids with us. And those, that just made it that much easier to turn on us. Their offspring helped to turn on, to turn us, uh, turn on Africans and take over the land and conquer that land. Um, Islam, Islamization is not the problem in Sudan because the majority for Navi people of Darfur are Muslims. Arabs do not consider black Muslims authentic or of consequence. Okay, did you hear that? So, the, so the, Islam has nothing to do with it in this instance because the majority of the Fernawi people of Darfur who are in Sudan are, mu are already Muslims. But the Arabs do not consider black Muslims even fucking authentic. And they don't see them as a consequence. They don't see them as an issue, like a prop, like, like a competition or something they had to really worry about. At best, they concede to blacks the role of ordained slaves or animals to be used as beasts of burden by the superior Arab race. 
The rule applies to all blacks, whether Muslims or non-Muslims, and whether of Nigerian, Hausa, Fulani, or Yoruba extractions, Tanzanias, Ugandans, Malians, or African Americans. A traveler in Sudan observed in 1930 that in the eyes of the Arab rulers of Sudan, the black slaves were simply animals given by Allah to make life of Arabs comfortable. In 1962, the Arab Sudanese general Hassan Bashir Nasir, while flagging off his, his troops to the war front against black Africans in South Sudan, declared, we don't want these black slaves, what we want is their land. A coalition of 50 charities in Darfur, Sudan, published a study in May, December 2008, confirming that the world, what the world already knew, that the Janjaweed and the Sudanese army, with the backing of their government during joint or individual attacks, raped, tortured, and killed Sudanese Africans and raised their, raised their villages to repopulate them with Arab nomads. They rounded up and abducted escapees from hideouts in the bush and at other times raided refugee camps to kidnap Africans as sex and labor slaves, working them to the bones as domestic and farm labor. The army flew their captives in planes to cart them at night and shared them among soldiers like you allocate bags of commodities and use them as sex and domestic servants. Kidnapped victims interviewed said their captors told them that they were not human beings and that they were there to serve them. In the five years between 2003 and 2008, over 300,000 Sudanese Africans were killed, 100,000 abducted, and 2.7 million rendered homeless refugees with their land appropriated by Arabs. The Khartoum government admitted 14,000 kidnaps. You can imagine what happened when the world turned a blind eye on Sudan in the 20 years between 1983, when the conflict began, and 2003. You have to ask yourself what African leaders are doing in AU with Arabs. Arabs are Africans' mortal foes. Al-Qaeda's, Al-Qaeda's bombing of the American embassies in Kenya and Tanzania left 260 black civilians that included 12 Americans dead. Over 4,000 Kenyans and Tanzanians were wounded. A remorseless top Arab journalist justified the attack by quoting Stalin, you can't make an omelet without breaking eggs. And so this was written by Nauwu Osahan, Honorable Ku Maku, leader, World Pan African Movement, Amir Spiritual, Spiritual Prince of the African Race, MSC Salford Dip, um, and just a lot of other titles. And what do you call them? Like uh, abbreviations or letters behind his name or her name. The End of the Knowledge, one of the world's leading authors of the children's books. Uh, awarded key to the city of Ten- Memphis, Tennessee, USA, honorary councilmanship, Memphis City Council, honorary citizenship, County of Shelby, honorary commissionership, County of Shelby, Tennessee, and a silver and a silver shield trophy by Morehouse College, USA, for activities to unite and uplift the African race. Nauj Asahan, renowned author, philosopher of science, mystique, leader of the world, Pan-African movement.